All right, good evening. This evening's lecture is uh, on the Greek language and civilization. And the more research I did on this, the more I came to the conclusion that we're last time talking about Chinese, it was continually you know, amazing and incredible and unbelievable the, the length of time that the Chinese civilization had been a coherent, uh, organized uh, civilization and its influence. Uh, with the Greek language and civilization, I, I decided the word is preposterous. It's <laughs> totally and completely preposterous to the point of it's almost unbelievable. Uh, certainly much of what I say will be true, but you won't believe it anyway. Because uh, it, 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 it almost defies reason the way the Greek language and the cultural influence of the ancient Greeks has continued um, to the modern world. So we, we set way back, if you look at the little um, timeline I gave you there, you can start with Proto-Greek, which is 3000 to 1600 BC. This is very speculative. It's one of those things where since we find evidence of Greek starting around 1500 BC, well, it must have existed before, right? So, <laughs> otherwise, it couldn't exist in 1500 BC. And so that, that's, that's a, a moderately speculative date. There's some indications that it may have been spoken and some influences, uh, but no real good hard evidence. I mean, easy to conjecture that it was there, but uh, the hard evidence really comes in the Myce Mycenaean period. Um, this is the Mycenaean Bronze Age. One of the great mysteries, by the way, of, of ancient world uh, the Minoan uh, civilization, Crete, uh, Athens was actually a, a site, Mycenae, of course, was one of the main sites. A flourishing Bronze Age culture, civilization, lots of trade, lots of archaeological ruins, huge, beautiful palaces, mosaics, writing systems, and then they vanish. Very quickly and completely, for 500 years, roughly, give or take. Uh, it's called the, the, the Dark Ages, the Greek Dark Ages or the, or the Bronze Age Dark Ages because nobody knows what's happened. If you look at the map on the back, uh, it's, it's, it's right around uh, a little north of Sparta um, in that region there on the end of the Peloponnesian uh, Peninsula. Um, that all, most of the sites are, are located around there, although there are other sites spread all around the Aegean Sea, actually, because it was a widespread civilization. And then it vanished. Uh, nobody's quite sure why, where they went, what happened. Um, and there are some other ancient peoples that are associated with this, but they left. Like I said, this, this, these weren't small, these were major palaces, major architectural and artistic centers. They had a written language, Linear B, which we'll, we'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, and then, like I said, for 500 years, you, you get nothing. Just sort of, it just all vanishes. The palaces are abandoned, burnt down, and destroyed. Uh, the writing system goes extinct. The artwork stops being influential. The technology drops off, um, not to be re rediscovered again until four or five hundred, maybe six hundred years later. Um, this is the time of the ancient Greek, uh, eight hundred to three thirty. Of course, these dates, any date with a language is fuzzy, right? So, so these are. R roughly the dates where you start getting the Homeric epics until you get the classics of Attic Greek of, of the, you know, Sophocles and, and, and Plato and Aristotle, these, these guys, um, which is the next period, sort of what we think of as classic Greek. If you think of classical Greek literature, you're almost certainly thinking of literature uh, from the ancient Greek period. Um, then you get the, what's called Coin Greek which is a, a word for a sort of simplified Greek that is spread and developed um, when Alexander travels about on his merry adventures, which we'll talk about. Then you get medieval Greek, which is the, is, which is the Greek that sort of follows on in, in the development of Constantinople, the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, Orthodox Greek Church, um, then finally, uh, that goes extinct. The, 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 one of the great moments in world history, the Fourth Crusade, on its way to liberate the Holy Lands, decided, no, what the heck, let's sack Constantinople. Uh, and so that was sort of the end, or the beginning, really, of the end of, of the Greek world. 
uh, at that point. And that's right around 1200. It was finally conquered. Generally the date they say, oh, the Ottoman Turks took Constantinople in 1450 or something like that. And that was the end of it. Now really, they, they were just mopping up the pieces that had been, it had been really shattered by the, by the Crusaders in, in the 1200s, in the 1202, 1202, I think. And then you get another interregnum from basically 1400, 1450, until the establishment of the modern Greek city, or the modern Greek state, Greece today, which is established in the 1830s. Um, and again, they re-simplify the language. So modern Greek is a, is a dramatically simplified version of uh, ancient Greek, and we'll talk about each of those phases. So that's kind of the timeline we'll follow. So if we go back, so you have Proto-Greek, you go, let's go to uh, Mycenaean Greek. So the, the Mycenaean civilization, like I said, is sort of mysterious. We have all these ruins, but they wrote, they left writing, which is great. They left Linear B. Um, and, and a few, is one of the great moments in archaeological history, a few seals of Linear B had been found it's in the 1850s a lot when, when this research is really beginning. A uh, few digs uh, had been done. Lots of stolen artifacts were turning up. And, and, the, and the guy who's running the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum, says, you know, let's go take a look at this. Let's go see if we can go out um, and, and find some more sites, because this seems like a specific language. Um, and so uh, Evans, I believe his name was, he, he travels to Greece and he rides a ferry to the island, gets off, stops and asks some people if they know there's any place where they could look around um, and see sort of the lay of the land. And they, yeah, go up on that hill and you'll see what's going on. And so he walks up there and he looks down and he finds a Mycenaean palace covered in linear B writing. <laughs> it's like the world's shortest archaeological discovery, right? It's literally like the first or second afternoon that he arrived, he just walks up and goes, Oh look, a palace covered in linear B with all this stuff and symbols and these act, act symbols on it. And he's like, well that simplifies things. And so they immediately got this treasure trove of, of, of linear B writing. It had been a little bit before, but this was, the, this was the jackpot moment. And so then they thought, right, now all we need is to decipher it. Ha. Um, yeah, it took about a hundred years. <laughs> uh, linear B was not actually deciphered until 1950s. Um, significantly, lots of people work on it, of course, but it's, it's the big breakthrough was a guy called Ventris, um, and he was an architect and interested in, in, in decipherment. I uh, worked on it. What really threw them off is they did not think it was Greek because the alphabet was not Greek for linear B. If you've ever seen it, it's not a Greek alphabet. Um, and finally, he realized, oh, it's a, a syllabary, um, and some symbols that are being used for a phonetic form of Greek. And so he worked with another gentleman who was an expert in ancient Greek language, and between them they were able to work out that, ah, yes, this is in fact ancient Greek written in a different alphabet. And so what this demonstrated is the continuity of the Greek language. It moved back the, the, the written date of Greek language from the Homeric period, which they had thought, you know, 800-ish or so BC, uh, all the way back to, to now we're talking 1400, 1500 BC. So again, that's why I said these discoveries keep happening. This is just 50 years ago that they were able to push back the written history of Greek five or 600 years. What an extraordinary achievement. They're still working on Linear A, by the way. No one has been able to translate it. It's an earlier form of, of course, Linear B. Uh, and they, they suspect that it's actually a, a type of written Minoan, but no one knows because they haven't been able to decipher it. Probably won't turn out to be uh, any form of Greek, but you know, stay tuned. They didn't think that Linear B was going to be any form of Greek. Why is it called Linear? Because um, that's a good question. I, that's a very good, I don't know why it's called Linear. Um, I'll check that. That's an excellent question. Um, so then you have the collapse of that civilization, but now we know it's, it was a Greek-speaking civilization. Uh, and then it's reborn in what we consider, the, if you know Greek history, this is the classical history of the city-states. And this is what's important to note. Throughout the period, if you want to say from, say, six or 700 BC until uh, Macedonia comes in in 350-ish BC, well, even earlier than that, really, 400 BC, um, the domination of, of Macedonia starts. What was predominant for that 300-year period in Greek history, two, two to 300-year period, 
was the city-state. You have to understand that. If, if the geography of Greece is incredibly um, daunting. Lots of mountains, they have mountains that run north and south and mountains that run east and west. And so there's all these cities that will be in a little valley between mountains that during the winter time may be impassable or nearly impassable. I mean, if you really wanted to get over the pass, you might be able to, but you know, you couldn't take a lot of trade goods, you couldn't do any of that. So for whole periods of the year, they would be cut off just because you couldn't get over lands with them. And then the second thing is the big means of communication in the ancient world, of course, the reason they ring the Aegean Sea, because it was often much easier to go by the sea. Ah, if it was calm. Well, the Aegean Sea is not calm all year. And so you definitely had periods when it was, hey, let's go out and sail around, and periods when it was like, no, let's just stay home. You know, if you really, again, if you really had to go do something, a military mission, or, you, you, they could do it, and they did do it. But generally, you didn't want to. So even the sea routes were, were, were dicey. So these cities were isolated both by the topology of the land uh, and by the, by the sort of dangers of sea traveling at the time. You really only wanted to go when things were pretty favorable, which is about six or seven months of the year. Um, and there's over a thousand Greek city-states, by the way. So if you ever read Greek history and you think, wow, there's just this endless progression of city-states and it always gets confusing because who can remember what? The answer is yes, you're right. <laughs> it gets confusing because in an area, you know, in the 20 miles where we are literally in ancient Greece, there would be like four or five city-states in many instances that had various wars going on with each other and then they would all team up together to fight a war against somebody else and then... The Persians would invade, and even more would team up to fight the Persians. Um, and you know that sort of cyclical process of fragmentation and unity, and fragmentation and unity, uh, led to a couple of things uh, that you know we inherited. Um, one is an incredible diversity of the Greek language. There, are, there are dozens and dozens of major um, dialects of Greek. They're usually divided into four or five, but if you look in the scholarship, you'll find that, well, really, the variation was quite expansive. Um, some of the main ones that I, that I listed there are Aeolic, uh, you know, Attic, Icon, uh, uh, Ionic, Doric, Lorian, Pamphylian, you know, the Homeric, Greek. All of these are different dialects, slightly different time periods, but this is for, mostly for the spoken Greek. All of them left some writing. This is the wide variety in spoken Greek. And then you get the Athenian ascendancy. This is a very important moment. What Athens managed to do, one is they sort of eliminated a few surrounding small city-states and aggregated them into one big city-state. So whether it had been, we're not sure how many, but say six or eight smaller city-states, they sort of leveled those in villages and pulled them all into an existing city, Athens, and made it much larger. And that was the beginning of sort of their material ascendancy. Um, and once they had this kind of scale, they started trading more, they formed the, the Athenian League. They became imperialist, essentially. Um, and as, as the power arose and, and was centralized with them, um, they became a center of what we, what we now know of culture and trade, uh, military ambition and aggression. Um, and they sent out, not just them, other city-states, but particularly the Athenians, uh, sent out then many, many, many little, they, they would found new city-states, colonies. So if your city got a little full or you had some political problem, one way to solve it was to say, hey, we'll just take the citizens and we'll go over there. There's nobody on the coast of Turkey in this area, so we'll just set up a city-state there and, and you'll communicate over the oceans with us. And so all these little Greek-speaking communities begin to spread out. They didn't hold huge swaths of land, so this is why it's a little preposterous. They're over a great expanse of territory, but in little pockets. They didn't tend to hold large areas. Persia held all the land. The Persian Empire was immense almost throughout this entire period. Uh, but the Greeks had this pocket, 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 pocket. Some of them were, of course, conquered by the Persian Empire and really didn't change anything. They kept speaking Greek. They kept trading with the Greeks. They just happened to be now on the Persian side of the border. Um, but it didn't change a lot about their culture. 
And so Greek slowly expanded to be a sort of lingua franca of the ancient Aegean area. Mediterranean started to spread up towards Egypt. If you were going to trade, that meant you were probably going to do business with some Greek seafaring peoples. And it turns out that everywhere you go, you would hit these little pockets that's either a small Greek city-state that has its own port that you want to trade with, or it's a large Greek community in somebody else's city. And so even though the population is relatively small, and they never formed huge governmental structures. Think about this, the greatest threat before the Macedonian invasion, who were sort of Greek anyway, um, to the existence of the Greek world was, of course, famously the, the invasion from Persia. There were a thousand Greek city-states at this time, more than a thousand, but, you know, lots. About 30 of them were able to get together to fight the Persians. The other 970 apparently couldn't agree about this, <laughs> right? I mean, so that's how sort of fractured and factionalized they were. So this is extraordinary in history for something that's so fractionalized, so spread out, so diffuse, to yet it wield so much influence. They did some conquering of very small cities that were built on coasts, but they mostly did lots of fighting amongst themselves and lots of trading. And so Greek became the sort of, again, second major language of trade and business. We think of it now as the language of philosophy and drama and all this, but if you ask anybody in the ancient world in 400 BC, oh, what's Greek good for? They say, oh, that's your trade and business language. That's your that's sort of imperial, not imperial, but sort of bureaucracy, trade, technology. The Greeks were very good with technology from early on, one of their big advantages of, over other peoples. That's what they thought. The Greeks, they're your, they're your organized business guys. They've got some technology, sort of like us today, right? People, they don't, you know, we're always disorganized in a mess, but we've got technology and we do business, right? That has sort of that, that similar element. And then you get, uh, well, I'm sorry, and then it's this period, of course, Attic Greek, all the Athenian, the, the sort of flowering of, of the Athenian civilization. You, you know, you get Socrates, you get the Academy, you get the Lyceum a little later, uh, the, the, the classic playwrights, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, um, you know, the Herodotus, Thucydides, you know, it's all through this period. All of the classics of literature, history, science, the, you know, begin that the Thales of Miletus begins, all that sort of earlier mathematical and philosophical works begin right around this time. So this is one of the, again, one of the great flowerings, famously, of world history. And then in roll, the next stage, which comes with the conquering of all of this, the independent city-state period, sort of conquering of it, uh, by the Macedonians. The Macedonians come in and basically tell everybody, look, you work for us now. Which was a really hard blow, because these had all been very independent city-states. This is what they had done. They didn't want to work for anybody for any reason. But it didn't take them long to figure out that, oh, really it doesn't change that much. It changes a little bit, but you just nod when the main guy comes through, and as soon as he leaves, you just do whatever you were doing before anyway. And so it sort of created this loose affiliation within the Macedon hierarchy. And that probably wouldn't have changed that much in the ancient world, except for this guy called Alexander the Great. So this is where we are at the, at the moment, right? It's, it's, a, it's 350 BC-ish. Greek is already a sort of Pan-Aegean language of trade, uh, business, a little bit of science, philosophy, but mostly, you know, sort of engineering type science. They've done a little conquering around, particularly now that the, the, the Macedonians are starting to march, but not, not that much. They're not really a massive imperial power yet. And then Alexander comes along. Um, they call him Alexander the Great. I think this is, I don't know, he was a great smasher of things. <laughs> it's, it, 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 really, he's like Napoleon. He didn't build a damn thing. He never, literally, he never built anything of note. He just smashed. He, he would go to some place he wanted to conquer. He would, he would you know, defeat the army in the field. He would say, okay, you are all my subjects now, and everybody would go, okay. And then he would leave a small colony of Greeks who were theoretically loyal to him, 
and march off to go conquer somebody else. But he never organized this into a functioning empire. He didn't, you know, there was no huge construction of road networks to connect everything or ports so that it was all in it. it nothing that had anything to do. It was literally a sort of smash and grab operation that just went on and on and on and on. Uh, he only, it only he did about 20 years he conquered an incredible amount of territory. But, but again, he did nothing to sort of stabilize it. He set up different forms of governments all over the place. Some places, whatever the locals had, he just said, just, just say you work for me. And they'd say, okay, we work for you. He was like, great, I'm out of here. And he'd leave, not even leave soldiers behind. Just take everybody, because the, his army was shrinking. He increasingly replaced his Greek soldiers with whoever was available at the, at the, at the time. And so it was not this, um, you know, it wasn't like the Greek world expanding. It was sort of like a, a military elite being dropped in little pockets all over the ancient world with nothing being affected underneath. It's a very strange way of occupying territory. Of course, Alexander dies very young, and, and if you look at the map that says the Hellenistic Greek world, this is the Hellenistic period, this is roughly 240 BCE, this is what's left. You have different um, Greek no, uh, elites running whole segments of the ancient world, but tiny, like a few hundred or a few thousand actual Greeks running Egypt. So, so you see how strange world this is? When, the, when all the administration, the very top administration is Greek speaking. They're, they're, most of them were first, second, third generation Greeks. They, a lot of them weren't born in, in Alexandria or, or, or wherever they were, uh, Gaza, uh, Babylon. But they were administering it in Greek. And so it had this strange thing where it created this vast empire of Greek-speaking minorities who ran everything. And what this meant was, if you want to get ahead in the world, you really wanted to learn Greek. Another way of looking, if you look at this, right, it, when, when um, Cleopatra is finally conquered by the Romans in, in Egypt, she was Greek. Right? She, was, she was Cleopatra. She was like the 400 years of Ptolemaic rule in Egypt comes to an end um, when Cleopatra, who is Greek, is conquered by the Romans. This is not... It was, but, but we don't tend to think of that. Like, well, she was the pharaoh. She was the leader of Egypt. She must have been Egyptian. No, she was a leader of Egypt. She was Greek. She spoke... Actually, Cleopatra spoke lots of languages. She was incredibly gifted that way, apparently. Um... And so, so in Alexandria, you had this veneer. In all of these ancient cities, you had this veneer. I couldn't even fit it on the map, by the way. If you go off on uh, this side of the map over here, uh, it goes all the way to the Indus River, right? The Greeks were all the way over into the uh, Hindu Kush mountains over in that region. So they were influencing things in India. They had Greek uh, provinces in India for you know, a couple hundred years again hanging out. Um, but again, they were always this tiny minority on top of the locals. So it became this language of the elites all over the ancient world. And almost nobody, percentage of population-wise, spoke it. Almost everybody who wanted to be anybody did speak it. So it became, again, this very uh, a language of incredible importance and, and prestige. And if you spoke really good Greek, for instance, if you came from Athens, you just happened to be born there, this was your ticket to wealth and fame and power. Because even if you were nothing in Athens, you could transship yourself virtually anywhere in the Greek world and show up and say, hey, I'm Greek. I can teach your kids to speak Greek. I can run your estate in Greek. I know how to talk to the people who run the... You're in business. Right? You, this was your entree to advancement. And so Greek acquired this incredible prestige. And you have to understand this is very important. Otherwise, what happens next, which is even more preposterous, makes no sense. <laughs> so, 
We know what happens next, right? What happens to Macedonian Empire? It is crushed totally and completely by the Roman Empire. Here comes the Romans. So generally speaking, if your empire, which was a very loose affiliation to begin with, of this, most of the people do not speak Greek, a few of the elites speak Greek, a new elite, the Roman, military, powerful, mighty, come marching in, they're organized, hierarchical, they're very literate, very well educated, they conquer the whole place, boom, crush it out, you're ours, end of subject. This is not the Macedonian Greeks conquering you, this is the Romans conquering you, these are new people. What happens with Greek? They adopt it. <laughs> the Romans adopt Greek. This is this is I, I, you guys, it's, it's totally inexplicable, almost. Totally. We know why, but it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's preposterous. Generally speaking, when your country gets conquered by foreign invaders, and anyway, nobody speaks Greek. Like I said, the thing is, the people were not speaking Greek in most of these areas. They were speaking Egyptian or Sumerian or uh, Persian or whatever the language was from their area. There's like this teeny tiny th elite. Those are the people you kill. You kill the elites who are ruling and you take their jobs. You don't think, I know, let's learn their language. But that's exactly what the Romans did. To the extent that one of the most famous... Uh, Roman historians, Plutarch, he didn't speak Latin, he spoke Greek. He was a Greek guy, he wrote in Greek. He went to Rome and spoke in Greek to Romans. They thought this was the greatest thing because that's the real goods. And so there's extraordinarily development that as the Roman Empire spreads, rather than destroying the Greek language, it actually spread it and increased its influence. It's like again, because it should have died right then, right? That should have been the end of, of not died entirely, but a few people around speaking, but as a major influential language. But instead, what happens is as the Greek Empire, I mean, as the Roman Empire expands, it spreads Greek with it. If you were a Roman citizen of any note, you spoke Greek. Greek, uh, Roman histories. Roman drama, Roman poetry was all modeled on, I mean precisely modeled on copies of Greek models, Greek epics. So the great Roman poet, the founding poetry of the Roman uh, existence, the Aeneid, is a combination of the Iliad and the Odyssey, all sort of rolled into one, quite, quite consciously. Um, and so the the... the in some ways, the esteem and authority and power of Greek actually increased. But it's also important to note it wasn't just any Greek. It was actually the Attic Greek of Athens during its classical period. Because those were the works that everybody recognized were the best. And so they said, if you really want to know Greek, you have to know Attic Greek. And I should stop and just take a, a, a I don't want to do too much linguistics here, but it's important to note that Attic Greek is impossible. Like, here, here's what it has. It's a more complex noun and verb and adjective system than Sanskrit, which is generally considered the most complex major language. Uh, only the oldest, most complex version of Sanskrit, which is Vedic Sanskrit, is nearly as complex as Attic Greek. So that's bad has the same tonal properties as Chinese. So it's a combination of an incredibly difficult conjugation morphological system with a tonal pronunciation system like Chinese. Usually you have simple grammatical languages that use tonal properties to provide complexity and subtlety, right? Or you have really complex grammatical languages like you know, English, fairly complex, but it has almost no tonal qualities, right? So it's a very atonal language. They had both. <laughs> it was so difficult that essentially if you weren't born in Athens, everybody knew it. If you weren't born in the Athens or the immediate environs, they could tell that you weren't a citizen. Uh, if you went away and lived for a long time and came back, people would be suspicious of you if they didn't know you. So I'm, I was born in Athens. They said, no, you weren't. You don't speak it correctly. I'm like, no, I grew up speaking it here. They're like, no, look, your, your pronunciation's off. 
So my question is, you said, well, we all know why they, 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 they took Greek. I don't know why they took Greek. Why? Okay, so, so, so they took Greek because of the cultural prestige that it had. Everywhere they went, there were these speak, Greek-speaking people who did, wrote beautiful poetry, wrote great drama, were doing all the science, and because they were the educated, the, the more they discovered, the more they loved Greek culture. They were completely conquered by the power, just as we have been, by the power of, Greek, of the Greek intellectual uh, achievements. The beauty of the language, the beauty of the drama, the beauty of the philosophy, uh, the power of the science achievement. By the way, there is, you don't want to say no, there's almost no record of any significant mathematical or scientific thinking in Latin during this period. All the serious scientific and, and mathematical thinking, of which there was a significant amount, was done in Greek. So if you wanted to learn math and science, which of course they want people to learn math and science, you know, engineering, they're doing a lot of work to run this. Um, you learned Greek, and then you thought in Greek and worked in Greek, because all the great classics were in Greek. What about, what about the, the Arabs? But we're a little late. We're, we're coming up. We're, we're getting there. Yeah, we're a little, we're a little later there. All right. So, so the Roman Empire expands, spreads out, and carries Greek with it to the point that by the time you get the founding of Constantinople, the eastern capital of Roman Empire, 300-ish, 400-ish BC, it had become an increasingly important port, uh, already trading port and center, and then eventually it was just became the capital, Constantinople of. of the two capitals of Rome and the western capital, Rome, Rome falls, and the eastern capital stays around for another thousand years. Um, Greek became, was the major language. They actually dropped Latin to second language status. That only took about 250 or 300 years. Greeks conquered by Romans, 300, maybe 400 years later, Constantinople, the main language is Greek. Latin has become the second language. This is, again, it's just totally absurd. It would make sense, like when people invaded China, I mentioned this here in China, eventually, it didn't take eventually, it took about a week, and they were all Chinese. Well, that's because there were a lot of Chinese, and there weren't that many invaders ever. I mean, they had enough to sort of conquer it and take up residence in the palace, and then they looked around and went, well, I guess we're going to learn Chinese. <laughs> And the, cultural and the cultural power of Chinese and their existent civilization was very... Well, here's the people, they, they did nothing. They were a lot of them. I mean, there was almost none of them in Egypt. There was almost none of them anywhere except for the Greek Peloponnesian area, and they didn't get along. <laughs> and again, you look, 400, 350, 400 years after they're conquered, Latin has dropped to second language status. Everybody's speaking Greek. It, like I said, it's preposterous. It's extraordinary. Um... But the influence of this is remarkable to this day. So, uh, the Western Empire falls, as we're famous, you know, the barbarians sort of invade and it's this long rolling battle over there. But the Eastern side, the Constantinople based empire, rolls along merrily for another thousand years. And their language is Koine Greek. But really, the really literate people in Constantinople are writing in Attic Greek. The last major works in Attic Greek were written in the 14th century. Roughly a thousand years after Athens was conquered by the Macedonians, who didn't speak Attic Greek. Again, this is just, what? How is this even possible? Then it all falls apart. Then, again, so the 12th century, or 13th century, the Fourth Crusade rolls in in 1202 and smashes Constantinople and breaks up all their territory around it, and then eventually that's overwhelmed by the Ottoman Turkish Empire. By 1500, there is no independent anybody who speaks Greek. There are Greek-speaking people, of course, still in the Peloponnesian area. But they didn't control any state. They had no authority. They had no bureaucracy. They had nothing. Um, at this point, historically, usually your language dies. That, well, that's it. You have no country. You have no power. You don't have a military. You have no institutions. The Ottoman Turks aren't all that interested in learning Greek. They don't care if you speak Greek, but they're not going to learn Greek. They don't run their bureaucracy in Greek a little bit, but not a lot. 
So you would think, well, there you go, death of the language. No. Incredibly, when Constantinople starts to fall in the surrounding era territory, the eastern, uh, the, the Byzantine Empire, as it calls, starts to crumble, well, the Greek scholar starts to travel out. They head out. And this happens to coincide roughly with the Renaissance. And so just as the Greek classics are being rediscovered in Florence and Vienna, all of a sudden these scholars start showing up who are going, wow, ancient Greek. They're like, well, it's not that ancient. That's what we speak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> more or less continuously. Right? They're like, we can help you out with this. We, we, can, we can make this work for you. At the same time, these Greek translators, lots of them Jewish, which I'll get to in a second, um, particularly in Spain, because the Arabs, when they started encountering the Greeks and conquering territory from the Romans, they're like, wow! And they, they started what they called the translation movement. And the translation movement was an attempt primarily to get these Greek works, they did other works as well, but really the ancient Greek words and works into Arabic, which then when they went to Moorish Spain, are preserved. And so, so many of the ancient Greek works we have actually only survive in their Arabic translations from the translation movement. But then when they're in Spain, where you have a, a sizable Jewish community and many scholars, some of them coming from the Byzantine world, some of them just have been there for the whole time, they go, oh, well, we can translate this because these are Arabic from the ancient Greek. We know the ancient Greek. We can learn the Arabic. We know that the European languages were in business. So weirdly, right at the time when you would think ancient Greek would be dead, it becomes the hallmark of the educated elite. <laughs> Any random humanist, humanist of note can learn Latin. Because, by the way, Latin is very much easier. Now, not all of them did, but you know, if you were to consider yourself an educated person, you're going to learn classical Latin. But if you're going to be the creme de la creme, if you're really going to be somebody that people want to consult, you want to learn your Attic Greek. <laughs> what the hell? Are you kidding me? It becomes like the principal bit. You know, it's like, yeah, this is like a thousand, I, mean, it's, I don't know, it's just like I said, preposterous. This is preposterous. They know no, they control no territory. They have no money, no army, no military, they have nothing. But the power of the literature, of the philosophy, of the intellectual progress, of the mathematics, it seduced the Romans, it seduced the Arabs, and then it seduced Europe that forgot that they used to be connected with this anyway. <laughs> And part of the reason was, is as the Latin classics really rolled through and were translated, they realized that all the Latin authors are either copying Greek authors or saying, wow, Greek authors, this, they're really great. Right? We've got stuff, but really it was the Greeks. Uh, if people are familiar with Plutarch. I mean, he wrote these things called parallel lives where he'd compare a Greek person to a Roman person and a Greek person to a Roman person. And not every time does the Greek person come out better. But after a while, you realize that Plutarch, although he's living in the Roman Empire, was really pretty much rooting for the ancient Greeks. The Romans never come out looking quite as good. It's a, it's a slightly tilted uh, history. And then, again, all the math and science comes out to be either in Greek or it's in Arabic. And the Arabic writer has translated this from the Greek. And so again, this is just astounding richness flows through. So that Greek becomes the language of the literati. And then the influence of the Greek world just continues. This is, I mean, again, un unprecedented, unparalleled, as far as I know, in world history. It would, I, I couldn't even think of a near analogy. Um, and that continues. Obviously, we know the story from there, right? The influence of the classics on Western civilization. It leads to the Enlightenment. I mean, this is what the Enlightenment authors are reading. Um, if you went to Oxford or Cambridge or any of the major universities in, in the Middle Ages up until basically the 1940s, what, what you studied were the classics, and the classics you studied were the classics that people thought you should study in ancient Greek uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. 
These were really good. Ancient Greeks thought they were really good works, and basically 2,000 years later, the Western civilization agreed. These are really good works. Um, right around 1830s, you get modern Greece is reborn. Total, not totally. They fought against the Ottoman Turks. They have no chance against the Ottoman Turks. However, the Western governments were very sympathetic to the notion of Greek liberty. One, they didn't like the Ottoman Turks because it turns out they're Muslims. Uh, two, they didn't like the Ottoman Turks because they're a big empire. And three, and hugely important, is because they were all sympathetic to the Greeks and they thought, well, the great Greek civilization should have its homeland back and should be independent. Because we love the literature so much, let's have them have a country back. And so this is more or less what happens. And so the modern Greek state is set up. And one of the first debates they have is what kind of Greek should be the official language. And there was a strong cadre that said Attic Greek. <laughs> Attic Greek, it's got to be Attic Greek. But they sort of came to their senses in a way. I mean, it would be kind of cool if they were still speaking Attic Greek. That would be kind of cool. But, but, but really, no, you don't want to be speaking Attic Greek. This is impossible language, right? So they came up with a simplified, uh, by the way, not simple. I don't want to say this is a simple language. It is not a simple language. But comparatively speaking, a simpler language than Attic Greek which is the primary language of modern Greece. However, they speak, again, like a thousand dialects. A hugely dialect rich because they're no more organized now than they've ever been. <laughs> but, but people see what's happening in Greece today. And in, in, in the Euro keep, European Union says, okay, you guys, let's get organized and, you know, all big. And they keep pretending like there is this thing called Greece. There is a thing called Greece. It is a political entity, but it's not an organized one. Anybody who's read any Greek history should realize it's never been organized. It's not going to be organized. Next week, next year, 100 years, they've never shown any capacity for organization. <laughs> right? This isn't, this isn't what they do. They're fragmentary. That's both the beauty of it, but also, you know, creates these you know, structural difficulties. Um, but, and that's where they are today. So this is, again, the preposterous arc of the Greek language itself. Now, the influence, I mean, somebody asked me a couple months ago, what do you think the influence of the Greek world was on in modern Western world? Of course, this is Western world, important to note this. Um, and I said, yes. <laughs> I mean, that was the only answer I could come up with. So, so here's just some examples for you from English, right? From English, um, I was thinking. Trying, I was writing sentences in my head in, in, in Greek. This is something that's fun to do to kill time. Um, so I came up with a couple. With the European political economy is a catastrophe. European political economy catastrophe. Greek, 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 Greek. You could say that sentence if you could pronounce it correctly to an Attic Greek two thousand years ago, and they would know what you meant. And they would agree with you. <laughs> they would say, yeah, they were a catastrophe then, and they were a catastrophe now. Right? Because, but they would say, of course, the Europe, to them were the barbarians. So they, yeah, of course it's a catastrophe, they're barbarians. Or um, art and technology emphasize intellect. Art, technology, emphasize intellect. Greek, 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 Greek. It's all Greek. And you go on and on. You can write sentences entirely in Greek that's more or less some slight variations because of pronunciation stuff, but, but basically directly from ancient Greek. Um, and again, specifically Attic Greek because that's the stuff that we love the classics in. So one influence has been that roughly 5-10% to of our language is literally loan words from ancient Greek. Notice a language that was conquered and essentially extinct 2,000 years ago. Roughly 25% of our language is based on Greek prefixes, suffixes, and, and, and variations of, of, of Greek words. Right? So that's a good solid influence, percentage-wise. So linguistically, we are very, very, very close to the, to the Greeks. We, we carry not just the language, though, but notice we get these concepts. They seem natural to us. Polis, political. That just seems, well, of course, you're political. No. No, this is a unique concept in the history of civilization. You have lots of civilizations that had no notion, even vaguely like a, a polis. And hence, when you say something like political economy, 
I was talking to my friend David Noble about how do you translate that into Japanese? Well, when the Japanese had to solve this problem, they had no idea. They, didn't have any, they had no near equivalent concepts. Japanese need to do it in about you know 1800, but we had been doing this for over 2,000 years, and we'd been living with the intellectual heritage of those concepts. So to us, it seems natural. To other countries that don't have this heritage, it's not natural. Then I thought, okay, other. Like I said, the, the answer is, of course, yes. It just we just are. We do live in the intellectual concept of the Greek world, democracy. We we live in a democracy. The whole concept of democracy is alien to basically 80% of world history. This is not a popular idea. It had essentially gone extinct, by the way, until the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Right? I mean, democracy was not that popular. You had a little parliamentary democracy there in England, highly uh, ambivalent one that kind of waxed and waned. Or another way to think of it, when the Magna Carta is signed 2,400 years after the, the, or later after the, um, or, or 14 or 1,500 years after the uh, reforms of Solon and Cleisthenes, which we'll talk about, that really sort of get democracy rolling in Athens, it gave limited legal appeal to a tiny group of barons. And that was like, wow, that's a major breakthrough in the history of political representation, the Magna Carta, the, the base of English law today. Well, the, the Athenians would have looked at that and said, look, that's just tyranny. We know tyranny. That's what we got rid of. Our democratic reforms made us more democratic than we were, and we were more democratic than the Magna Carta already. Right? I mean, so in the history of civilization, this notion of democracy comes from one place, and that is this crazy Peloponnesian Peninsula, where they were experimenting with everything. If you ever want to see a compare, just how wide they were experimenting is compare the history of Sparta and the history of Athenian democracy. The Spartans set up what is, for all intents and purposes, the most successful communist state ever. They made it work for a couple of hundred years. Turns out you can make it work in that environment, uh, but I don't think anybody today would want to live there. Uh, very brutal, uh, very interesting sort of, of society, but that was what they were shooting for. Just a couple, not even a hundred miles, I don't think, from Athens, not far, where Athens is sort of experimenting with radical democracy at precisely the same time. And they're in the same civilization. Crazy. But it's not just that we have democracy, it's the precise form of democracy we have. It wasn't sort of influenced by, it wasn't like, goodness, those Greeks had an idea, and we'll just run with it in our own crazy way. Our founding fathers, particularly Thomas Jefferson, lived with a copy of Plutarch. And I used to think, wow, what a great insight. Okay, when you have our foundation of America, you have this problem that you have some little states with a little bit of population, and you have big states with a lot of population. Well, the little states don't want to be dominated by the big states, and the big states don't want to share a lot of power with little states because they're so much smaller than them. How do you possibly reconcile this? So they came up with the bicameral system, where you have population in the lower house, and you have um, state representation in the upper house. I thought, wow, that's genius. Well, then I read Plutarch. That's Cleisthenes. <laughs> in fact, it's a radically simplified version of what Cleisthenes came up with. I'm like, hey, wait a second. They just stole it. <laughs> they didn't invent that at all. I mean, it's still a great achievement. Don't get me wrong. It's amazing. But when you realize that Jefferson lived with Plutarch, and then our Constitution just happens to look exactly like some ideas that Cleisthenes came up with, you know, 2,000 years before, you start realizing the influence is not a little bit. It's direct and profound. The other thing people talk about is why, you know, the early democracy wasn't that democratic because you had to have uh, land ownership, right? They had to have property. If you didn't have a certain amount of property, then you couldn't participate in government. And we're like, oh, that, that was terrible. Where did they come up with this idea? They come up with this idea from so long. So long, earlier than Cleisthenes. He's the guy that got the ball rolling with democratic reforms in Athens. If you have an aristocracy that's kicking everybody else around, how do you negotiate a deal with them? And uh, Solon's response is, look, 
some people get to participate in the government. And we'll make that based on property. That way, the most powerful people, who of course have most of the property, still maintain a lot of authority, but they can share it with people who have less. And if you have no property, of course, you don't participate in government because you don't have a stake in the game. That was the idea. So long as reform. Cleisthenes went further than that uh, when he did his reforms. But So both of those models, again, not randomly, not a little bit, specifically, and you know, at some places it seems word for word, taken from these ancient Greek equivalents. Um, other influences. Here's one of the weird things for you. Why is the New Testament written in Greek? What? What, what the hell? This makes no sense. Who dominated the Christian world? Right? Christ was under the dominion of Rome. We know this Rome. Rome, Rome, right? That's why I said that's so weird. But the lingua franca was not Latin, it was Greek. What, what, what a bizarre notion that is. And so the New Testament is written primarily in Greek. Hence, by the way, the Greek Orthodox Church. The Greek Orthodox Church means we still speak Greek. The language of the original books. Um, at the time of the Roman domination of the world, before that all falls apart, probably, this is controversial, but it, it's certainly close to as many Jews spoke Greek and read the, the Bible, the, the, the Torah, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible as read it in Hebrew. Um, so that you know, more Greeks, or at least as many, or, or nearly as many uh, Jews, were getting their Judaism directly from the Greek. They couldn't read Hebrew, they read Greek, and the Septuagint was in Greek for them. And so all these Greek Jewish communities around the, the world, the ancient world, were speaking Greek, reading Greek. And so our Christian heritage, which you know may have noticed somewhat influential, um, comes to us in Greek. That's the language of the Christian heritage. The New Testament is a Greek document, primarily Greek, a little Aramaic here. Primarily Greek document. The Old Testament, in its translations, and the Torah and its translations come to us often and in many influential ways in the Septuagint, in the Greek. So both from the enlightened tradition of the intellectual tradition of um, you know, science and math, Euclid's geometry famously, some still argue it's the most printed book in history, you know, but next to the Bible and the Quran. Uh, that whole line of thinking, democracy, individual liberty, okay, that's a huge river of influence on us today. But also, Christianity. You know, the Greek Orthodox Church still exists today. They still have a pope. I don't know if they call him a pope, but they still have a head guy. They're still fighting with the Catholic Church. They've been doing that for over a thousand years. They can't quite overcome the schism. Um, vast influence, by the way, the Russian Orthodox Church. Was, was very influential by the, by the monks, Byzantine monks, leaving the Greek world and translating all that Greek scholarship into Russian. Right? So this influence spreads all over through our culture in an amazing number of ways. Uh, like I said, to the extent that it's almost unimaginable we live in the ancient Greek world. A, a few more for you, just to bounce off. I mean, I could, I could go on forever, uh, literally, because the influence is so profound. Like I said, not just the notion of democracy, but the actual physical structure of democracy that we live in. The notion of our Supreme Court, by the way, is taken directly from a council of, I believe they're called ephors, that Solon set up, who could judge what everything else was going on and make sure that people followed the rules. This is where our idea of the Supreme Court comes from. It's, again, you look at it, it's exactly the structure. That they wanted to have a certain group that was outside of the democratic system who could make sure everything, people were playing by the rules because they recognized early on that you know, there are challenges and limitations to it. A people's army. 
One of, the, one of the hilarious ideas that people keep saying is they say, well, if our senators and House members had to go fight wars, we would never have any more wars. The history of ancient Greek proves this to be absolutely false. They voted themselves to go fight more wars, more often than any people. I, it's almost unimaginable how many wars they fought. They voted themselves to go fight. The rules of participatory government for ancient Greece in almost its entire period was based on your capacity to arm yourself so that you could then go fight. The original division was the lowest people had the power to make themselves a hoplite to buy that kind of armor. The next level was the cavalry. If you could afford to be a cavalry, that made you sort of like a senator. And then the people up above that were sort of the, the general class and they could they kind of pay for other people to go fight with them. But they all went off and fought together. And they fought war after war. Some of them were defensive wars. A lot of them just crazy. But that notion of the citizen soldier, again, that fell out of use for several hundred years. Because notice, to arm your citizens to go fight a war suggests they like you. <laughs> think, think how this would work out, right, in, in most countries today. You know, or for certainly ancient countries, right? This was not that popular. They would fight to defend themselves. But if you said, okay, we're going to march over there and attack those people, they're like, well, why? I don't know those people. I don't want to fight those people. And so mercenary armies were the order of the day for several thousand years. It was an innovation of the Greek city-states to have a populace that was so invested in the country that they would fight for the country. When the Persian Empire rolls in with Xerxes, these guys, it's not a volunteer army of citizens of the Persian Empire who are showing up. No, these are mercenaries or sort of moderate slave armies. And one of the reasons the Athenians were able to win, amongst others, is that as historically has this proven not to be so good. Napoleon, incredibly good general, no question. But one of the things that he reawakened in the people was this idea of fighting for France. You're fighting for France, not for money, not for yourself, but for France. And when you go and fight these other armies that are like, okay, we'll pay you $100 a day to fight, you win, often, more often than not. Slave armies, merchant armies do not fight, generally speaking, historically as well as citizens who are identifying with a greater cause. France, Athens, America, whatever it is. And so th these notions, these structures, these conflicts continue into the modern world, and, and, and they will stay with us. But again, they, they originate, many of these ideas originate directly and come to us directly and amazingly from you know, 2,400 years ago or longer, 2,600 years ago. And final thing to note here, if you want to know why we are not China, why we're not Japan, why we're not some other civilization? Much, not all of course, but much of the difference is did you inherit this mode of thinking about the world? And it is a mode of thinking. Imagine you've grown up in a society that has no concept of citizen. It just doesn't exist. It's not... And all of a sudden, okay, so now it's the 19th, 20th century. Okay, you're entering the 20th century, and you say, okay, you're the people. And now the people matter, and you have individuality and all. But you just got them yesterday, a week ago, 10 days ago. It's not like a conceptual core of your civilization and your values and ideals, however closely followed or not followed, by the way. Think of it again. Like, where does this idea of a personal relationship with God come from, the Protestant Reformation? This, this is a crazy notion. Many people at the time noted this looks suspiciously like paganism, where everybody gets to have their own God. This is one of the things the Catholic Church was saying. That's not Christianity, that's paganism. You each have a personal God? I wonder where that idea could have come from. <laughs> right? I mean, so it's, just, it's, it's, it's endless, and it's interwoven in there. But again, if you read other classics from other civilizations that we've talked about, you'll encounter this over and over again. And let me finish with just a few suggestions. If you want to read, if you only want to read one thing to get a sense of this, it's got to be Plutarch. Parallel lives. Just has to be. A, it's 
It's great to read. He was a huge gossip. If you love gossip, Plutarch is your man. So he's fun, incredibly insightful, and he did again in the Parallel Lives, he did this whole series of comparing and contrasting. So you'll get uh, Theseus and Romulus, the, the theoretical founder of Athens, the legendary founder of Athens and the legendary founder of Rome. Um, you get these, you know, Alexander the Great compared to Caesar. Um, and, and so, you know, you get both the history and the biographies, but then you get Plutarch's incredibly insightful commentary and reflection on, on what was going on. And it reads as a very modern document. That's what's incredible. The reason it reads like a modern document is because people who learned to write biographies learned it from Plutarch. <laughs> no, I mean, see, this is where the idea of writing biographies like this comes from. Then, then you can read something like Thucydides' Peloponnesian War, a little longer, a little more complex. The landmark version, by the way, is great. Um, and you realize where we got the idea of writing history. It comes from Thucydides. Thucydides is writing history more or less exactly like someone could write a history today. No problem. You can go back, Herodotus, a little, little, little more challenging, but same thing, he's a little earlier, but Thucydides is very much more direct and focused and compressed, the way we like it now. Um, and then I, then I would say everything by Aristophanes. Um, I think Aristophanes, I'm, I'm, I'm in a minority of one in this, by the way, the greatest philosophical thinker of the ancient uh, Greek world was Aristophanes. I put my money on him every time. A, he's funny which makes it great. Uh, and B, he seemed to be one of the least prejudicial thinkers. I mean, everybody in all of our times were sort of bound by uh, our traditions and all this. Aristophanes seemed to be the one most clearly uh, struggling with the traditions and problems of his age. For instance, he and Euripides, to a certain extent, started pushing on the whole women's rights issue. Um, this didn't go anywhere. Everybody thought it was hilarious and stupid, but it's pretty clear that Aristophanes and Euripides were both going, you know, this whole women issue, we should work this out. They also started raising the question about slavery. Right? You start getting the first, like, hey, this slavery stuff, what's going on with that? You know. So for to understand some of this early influence and to see the preposterous similarities, again, the preposterous similarities, uh, go to the original authors, Aristophanes, uh, Thucydides, Plutarch, and then you can just go from there, right? All of the greatness. But again, here it is. We, we live in the Greek world. Our language, 20-ish, 25% Greek. Our concepts, 80% Greek. Uh, our, our world looks to us from the, the, the lens of the Greek intellectual tradition. Um, and there you have it. The Greek world and civilization. Thank you.